welcome to the Matt Lagore Show. I'm your host, Matt Lagore. And what I like to talk about is entrepreneurism and personal growth. And that is what my show is based on. Uh, I myself am an entrepreneur and businessman in the North Reading area. I have a business called Dentcraft, which is right down the street. But I also like to discuss the subject of being an entrepreneur. And the subject of being an entrepreneur also encompass, encompasses business and personal growth and inspiration. And what do we sorely lack in our world today, in our lives today, is inspiration. I think that we are bombarded with uh, topics of fear and hatred and unhappiness, and that permeates your soul. And it, uh, it does a number on you, whether you realize it or not. So myself, I decided that I would do something about it. And I decided to start my own. Uh, I started with a radio show. And now I have a small television show where I talk about being an entrepreneur. But not just about me. I have a guest on uh, with me every week. And I like to uh, share what I consider to be someone who is an expert in their field or very good in their field so that we can get a perspective of not just what I do, uh, but what everybody does. Because I think that everybody in life really wants to be great. And everybody's missing the mark by just that much. You know, and as you look at somebody who you might consider to be extraordinary and you wonder, like, how, how, could, how do they do it? How are they extraordinary? And the answer is right in the word itself, extraordinary. It's extraordinary. So what they do is something ordinary, but they do it just a little bit extra. They do just a little bit more. So my goal is I hope that anybody who wants to be an entrepreneur or wants to do better at being an entrepreneur will get maybe that little boost they have, the boost they need, from what we're talking about or from who my guest is on the show. You know, I think about an example of someone who was uh, extraordinary at what they did, and uh, that would be uh, Mickey Mantle. Now, anybody my age knows who Mickey Mantle is. Anybody younger may not. But if you go on to Google, uh, you'll find all, what you, all you got to put is Mickey Mantle. You'll find out all you need to know about him. One, th one thing about Mickey Mantle is he was an exceptional baseball player. Uh, when he uh, first came into the league, he was a, a phenom. Um, and he set, I don't know that he set many records, but he did uh, achieve many high uh, goals, whether it was home runs or hits or stolen bases. But one of the things about Mickey Mantle uh, that, w that a lot of people don't talk about was he was uh, a bit of a disappointment because he never reached his true potential. He truly was, and he had the talent to be the greatest baseball player of all time, but he chose, instead of to do that little extra, uh, he chose to go out and have a little bit more fun. Uh, he decided to stay up a little bit later than he should have. And one of the things he said in his uh, memoirs was that he wished he'd spent a little bit more time in the training room after injuries instead of going out with his buddy Billy Martin and partying. So it cut his sh career short. Although he had a very good career, he never reached the potential that he really had. Uh, he didn't do that extraordinary thing to become the greatest of all time. Now, some of you might say, well, you know, what, what's the big deal in that? Well, I don't know. I guess if he's happy and people are happy, it's not a big deal. But let's take another athlete who was anything but extraordinary when he first came into the league, and that was Tom Brady. Tom Brady, when you first saw him when he joined the Patriots in the year 2000, was average at best. But he did one thing better than anybody else. He did one extra thing, an ordinary thing, a little extra. And every year, Tom Brady works on one part of his body and one part of his game. And now, as you know, the rest is history, and Tom Brady is maybe uh, in the conversation of the greatest of all time, uh, certainly one of the greats of all times, and he looks like a million bucks all the time, which uh, is uh, a shocking that a guy who's almost 40 looks about the same as he did when he was about 30. Um, but that's part of being... Uh, extraordinary, doing a little bit extra. And it doesn't necessarily just mean in the world of sports, it can be in business. Uh, it also uh, it entails being uh, healthy all right, and taking care of yourself. And today we're going to have on the show with us uh, my good friend, uh, Dan Murkowski. Dan is a professional doctor. Right. And when I say professional doctor, I mean you're not just someone we call doctor, you truly are a real right. doctor. Right. Uh, and where do you uh, perform, uh, where do you work uh, right now? Now I'm the chief of OBGYN at Hallmark Health, which is Melrose Wakefield Hospital. Okay, all right. And how long have you uh, been doing this? I've been working there for 24 years now. 24 years, yeah. wow. That's a, that's a very serious position. Yeah. 
A lot of responsibility, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, along with your responsibility, you have a family also, too. I do. My wife, Pamela, and I have six children. We have three girls and three boys, no twins. Uh -huh. <laughs> and we, um, we've been living in Melrose, or we grew, both of us grew up in Melrose, and we moved back to Melrose when I started my practice. Okay. And how old's your oldest child and your Sarah, youngest child? Sarah's 30 years old, mm -hmm. and she has my granddaughter, Ella, and my youngest is David. He's 16. 16. So the, the, pretty much the better portion of your family life You've also had this very responsible position uh, working in the hospital, yeah, correct? Yeah, been busy. Yeah, yes. yeah, you've been busy. Now, you don't only just uh, practice as a doctor and spend time with your family, but uh, one, uh, how I got to know you, the first place I met you, was uh, in uh, network marketing and as being yes. in, in an entrepreneurial uh, setting. Yes. So, and you do a lot of that also. Yes. So, you know, where do you find the time <laughs> to be a doctor, care for six children, all right, now they're, they're adults now, but still, you know, 10 years ago they weren't. And uh, you have a grandchild, too. Right. Uh, where do you find the time for all it's this? It's busy. I get asked that question a lot because we only all have 24 hours in a day. And I think I learned a while ago, and it really has helped me, is that I've made priorities. And I really try to set my priorities and be true to those priorities. Mm -hmm. And my family's always been my priority. So any of the free time that I have, I really try to spend time with them, whether it's Ella when she comes over the house with Sarah and Dan, her husband Dan, or if it's even my kids and taking them on trips, spending time with them recreationally, going for walks, going to parks, just really setting those priorities because I know the time is short. So right. I don't know how I learned it, but it was just something that Pamela and I have always done. So you have to cut things out that don't fit into those priorities. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's watching the news at night or getting hooked on a TV show, a sitcom that you can't be without. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's things that we've loved to share as a family too, like American Idol was mm -hmm. one of ours when it was a big show a few years ago. And there wouldn't, wouldn't be a week that we would miss you know, American Idol. But we, it's really that time together, those commonalities that we shared that brought us close. All right, so your number one priority, family, family. right? All right, now could you also say that your family was a, a reason why or a big why in your life, right? Big why, yes. Yeah. All right, so it's, it, it caused you to strive for bigger and better things. Even when I was applying to medical school, I can remember just having that feeling about not letting people down and yeah. really pushing, doing those extraordinary things you know, during times when I really didn't feel like doing them, but I knew they would pay off later. Mm -hmm. All right. By the way, how long have you been married? 31 years. 31 yeah. years. That's, a, that's, a, that's an accomplishment. I it know. really is. It's something to be proud of. You know, in this day and age, marriages... Uh, don't always last, and if right. they do last, they're they're not always very happy. Right. And I see you and Pamela, and I see your family. Yeah. You guys are very very happy. You know, it shows on your face. It shows in your in your camaraderie because you guys right. not only spend time as a family together, you do business together too. Right. We you we know, we've been best friends since we were 15 and 16 years old. Yeah. And we had this plan, and it seems like our life keeps going in 20 year plans or 20 year segments, and we kind of plan things that way. So if we look back at our life, many times we say, wow, there's another 20 years. So we're in the middle of a 20 year segment of our marriage right now. Mm -hmm. And we still make those plans. We still 10 years from now have a different goal, a different plan that comes then, so. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, and you know, one of the things I've always had a hard time in life with is goal setting, like yeah. long-term goal setting. Um, I can plan a goal for you know, a couple days from now, no problem. Right. And maybe even I could go as far as a month all right. But once I would get past that point, I would get kind of in a, almost a confused, overwhelmed state. Now, can you relate to that at all? All the time. Everyone does it. You're not alone. There are certain tricks. There are certain things you can do to help keep yourself on track. One of the things that Pamela and I do all the time is write them down. Mm -hmm. It's been done. It's been studied over and over again right at Harvard University that people that are the most successful are those that write their goals down and read them every mm -hmm. single day. So I can tell you that Pamela's got the best penmanship. She puts <laughs> our 20-year goals down on a piece of paper, hangs it in our bathroom. We're, you know, we're going to spend time during the day, yeah. and we see those goals, and we read those goals every single day. All right. And right. as we attain them, we cross them off. So right yeah. now, that the 20-year plan that we have going has quite a few lines through the goals. Do you reward yourself after you attain a goal? I think that's important. Yes. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Simple things. It doesn't Simple, have to yeah. be big. Right. It could be a dinner out. Sure, you know, right. just spending more time together doing some of the things we like to do. Mm -hmm. It could be upgrading the first class on, a, on an airplane when, it, when there's a good deal, like you know, a couple hundred bucks will get you in the first class and we'll say, you know what, 
we did this, let's go for it. And so we do that. It's that the kind of little, things little things that add up. They make, they make the quality of life a little bit better. That's right. I grew up in a household where uh, the little things did not count. Right. All right. <laughs> and my dad was constantly, you know, oh, no, we don't need that. Oh, no, we don't need that. And best of intentions, you know, right. best of intentions. It wasn't trying to deprive anybody. He just thought that was frugality, you know. Yeah. But really, the little things add the spice of life, you know. Add make it. things That's right. great. So now you're a doctor, okay. Yes. And by the way, you look like a million bucks, Joe, okay. <laughs> All right. And, you know, I say that with, uh, you know, a little bit of resentment, but I'm willing to put it behind me for the rest of the show, okay? okay? All right? Because you're older than me, but you look yeah. younger than me, okay. all right? So, now, I know it's not because you take the best medication in the world. No, all I right? don't take any medication. You don't take right. any medication, right? Now, now, as a guy, I'm 50 years old. You know, there's been times in my life that I've been told, look, you've got to take a little medication right now. You know, you don't have to take it forever, but you've got to take it. And it really would bother me. It, it troubles me when... You know, a little high blood pressure, you right. got to take some medication, right. all right? Now, um, as you've been practicing medicine, uh, you've had some experiences where you've been kind of like almost, um, you know, left questioning, right? right? Questioning what you're doing. Right. So, you know, at this point in your life, you're, you're not just a medical doctor, but you're an overall health doctor, correct? Right. That's right. You know? Lifestyle medicine. Doctor. Lifestyle medicine. So that's what you're kind of focusing on right now. Can you just tell us a little bit sure. about that and why? What caused you to change? That gets people confused because they've never heard it before. But Matt, I can tell you that it wasn't long ago that I was just like you. And I thought that I was doing everything right. I thought I was eating well. I thought I was exercising well. I thought that my family was being taken care of properly, getting put on those medications because they really needed them. But no one was really telling them what changes they had to make in their life in order not to have to go on those medications or even turn those conditions around, reverse those conditions. I didn't even know that existed until I started following patients over time. You know, when you're doing residency, you don't see patients over long periods of time. You're working in clinics, you see them just sporadically. If You would be lucky to see the same patient more than once. So you weren't able to really see how patients, how their health progressed. But in private practice, after about 10 years, I was seeing that. I was seeing my patients getting put on medications, and they would ask me about them, like Simvastatin for their high cholesterol or, or, or low presser for their blood pressure. And I didn't understand enough about why they just m made those changes, why their bodies were just changing and had to go on those medications. And they started putting on weight. Or even at that time, I can remember they were, they were seeing shows on TV where Dr. Oz was talking about supplements, and I knew nothing about what he was talking about, vitamins. What did they really do? Most mm -hmm. doctors didn't even believe in the vitamins. Mm -hmm. But then it really hit me when it started affecting my family. And when my father, when I found his wallet after he died, and I saw in the billfold the laundry list of medications that he was on, 17 different medications he was on when he died, that's when it really changed my life. Mm -hmm. And I knew that what, what I was doing, what I was practicing, wasn't really medicine. I wasn't helping people with their health. I was fixing problems. I was a very good gynecologist, a very good obstetrician. I was really helping people, but I wasn't keeping them healthy. And neither were my colleagues. So I thought, maybe I signed up for the wrong thing. Maybe medicine wasn't my calling, because I didn't feel like I was doing my all. And so I went on the journey. I took Pamela with me. We went to a lot of different conferences on preventative medicine, integrative medicine. Thought maybe that was the answer. We even looked at herbal medicine. Maybe it was some Eastern Chinese medicine that has been practiced for thousands of years and very successfully. Maybe that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. And then I found lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm. And lifestyle medicine, pillars are really on nutrition, which is the fuel for our body. And yep. many of us don't understand. Doctors don't understand nutrition. Mm -hmm. Lots of nutritionists don't understand nutrition. And at that time, I didn't either. So I had to go and become a nutritionist. So I went and became a nutritionist. Mm -hmm. Learned it. Found out what does the food do once we eat it. Where does it go? How do we process it? And then how can it be toxic to our body if we're not eating the right foods? Once I found that out, really everything changed. And then I learned, too, that our bodies were built to move. We, we, when people talk about they want to go back in time and eat like we did 10,000 years ago or live like we did 10,000 years ago, 
We moved a lot 10,000 years ago. You don't even have to go back that far. If you go back a couple of hundred years, our grandparents you know, ate different food than we eat today, worked differently than we work today, exercised all the time, moved their bodies all the time. Yeah. So I just started putting those pieces together, found lifestyle medicine, and joined that movement, joined that movement of a few, you know, when, I, when Pamela and I first went, there were 50 people in the room. We're going to go this year the, in November to Naples, Florida, where they're having their, their annual meeting, mm -hmm. and there's going to be over 1,000 doctors in the room, and that's just over a five-year period. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So the movement is really getting be bigger and bigger, better and better, and we're really starting to understand a lot more about what we didn't understand back in the 70s and 80s when I was coming up through the system, through medical school, learning the science, learning the biochemistry, how everything worked, the physiology. But now it's kind of all changing, and we're, and we're starting to really understand how everything's connected and that when we don't connect the dots, that's when disease, when dis-ease comes in. And when you have dis-ease, you have to step back, take a look at what you're doing, primarily in what you're feeding your body. You are what you eat. Everyone knows that. And it's really interesting, Matt, because when I put choices in front of people, they know the right choice. Yeah. I don't have to teach them anything. They really kind of know because they've heard it, but no one really wants to accept it. People really like the lifestyle, the convenience, the way things are going with technology. But we have to sometimes look back and really try to break it down and try to understand how it all works. I want to ask you a question. Okay. Sure. So uh, one time you told me you, you had this little synopsis of like how to eat healthy and you had it in like two sentences. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All right. Can, can you say that? Sure. You know, one of the things I did was I started reading everybody. And one of the authors I really enjoyed reading was Michael Pollan because Michael Pollan uh, he's a journalist, but he is a journalist that really understands nutrition and writes about nutrition all the time. And when he wrote his books, he came up with six words. Eat food, mostly plants, not much. And if you follow that, that rule, it will, it will keep you away from over you know, the 85%, 90% of what's killing Americans today. Mm -hmm. Chronic disease. Keeping it healthy. Eat so keep food. it simple. Eat, Eat food. food. Mostly plants and not much. Right. Most of us don't even know what food is. We think food, you know, we break it down into its components, into its macronutrients, protein, carbohydrates, fats. How many times have you been to a restaurant and ordered a salad and the waitress says to you, would you like protein on that? She doesn't really want to say that, right? She knows yeah. that if she says meat, that's kind of a taboo word, yeah. right? People know that meat's not good for you. We've heard that over and over again. So we've changed our vocabulary to make it sound a little better, to make it sound a little more acceptable. So we use words like protein. And now I don't want to eat those carbs. I can't remember, Matt, the last time I had a bowl of carbs. Yeah. Right? I either. eat yeah. food. Yeah. So you've know, you got to understand that all foods have all these things. And so once you figure that out, it gets easy. All right. So I want to, I want to, I want to give you a little story. All right. Sure. So um, over the winter last winter, I, I gained probably about 15, 20 pounds. All right. Uh, some of it was stress related. I'd say all of it was stress related, to be right. honest with you. Okay. Right. And uh, so during uh, the the late winter, early spring, I said, you know what? I, I need to lose some weight. All right. I'd gone to the doctor, and the doctor yeah. said, you know, my blood pressure had gotten high, and he said, you need to lose some weight. So I said, okay, I'll eat healthy. All right. Right. So I went and I started eating healthy. Right. All right. I didn't lose weight. I started gaining weight. Mm. So I said what am I doing wrong? And I started getting frustrated, like, oh, I just can't lose weight. You know, that was, that's, a, that's a great cop-out, by the right. way. Oh, I just can't lose weight. So I decided I got a little app, and I put it on my phone, and I recorded everything I ate, and it told me the calories. It even breaks down the food for you, like, right. you know, the, the, how many vitamins you're getting, everything. It breaks it all down Macro for you. Macro and micronutrients. Right. Yes. And so I looked at it, and what I thought was a healthy diet was like about almost 3,000 calories wow. a day of, of food, all right? And I was still hungry. Yeah. I just went by that app. I did something simple, all right? I went by that app and I cut my calories down to about about 2000 or so with a, you know some I'd w in walking once a day so I could burn off 3 or 400 calories. Right. And wouldn't you know, I started losing weight. Yes. All right? Something so simple as that, all right? I've been overwhelmed with that. You know, in my family, you know, eating disorders and uh, gaining weight has been like um, kind of like an epidemic, all right? right? It's always been hard in my family, you know? Yeah. But we didn't have the right education. So now if you're talking to someone like me, okay, say I came in and I'm like, Dr. Dan, yeah. I, I don't know what to do. 
What would you say to me? Well, you already did the first step. The first step is to journal. Yeah. You got to know where you are, right? So your first thing is to figure out where you are. And you have to be able to look back so you can measure and track and then make the adjustments just like you did. Mm -hmm. So that's the very first step. The next thing is to know your numbers. You have to know exactly where you are with your, with your chemistries in, in your body, what, you, what your blood work looks like, your cholesterol, your fasting blood sugar, just so you know. And, and then you're like your waist circumference, your BMI, your body mass index. Mm -hmm. You know, how much do you weigh according to your height? Not the best in all cases, but a pretty good benchmark to know if you're at your ideal weight or optimal weight for, yeah. your, for your size. So you just kind of gather information would be the first thing that I do. Mm -hmm. And then start with some education and start l trying to teach people how to make it simple in their life. Like I just did to say, you know, eat food, make sure yeah. it's real food and not processed food, not food that comes in boxes or cans or bags that have labels all over them. Because that can be very confusing to everybody not to really know because what they put on the front of the package is how, do you, how they catch your eye. It doesn't mean that what's inside is really good for you. So you have to really understand the food that you're eating. So you want to eat food and then you want to eat mostly plants. And I always talk about things that I've learned through the mentors that I've had, through some of the greatest nutritionists that I've visited with, that really it's about food groups and making sure those food groups get into your body every day. Mm -hmm. And most of them are really very nutrient dense with very low caloric burden on yeah. you. Yeah. And those food groups would be like fruits and vegetables, whole grains mm -hmm. and seeds. So mm -hmm. you're talking about not whole grain bread, but things like oats and, and brown rice or red rice or black rice or quinoa that a lot of people now are starting to introduce into their diets, those whole grains. And then the last one would be the legumes, like beans, you know, and peas and peanut butter. And you know, things that you, you, you wouldn't even think were packed with such nutrient density, but not only that, the fiber. The fiber, Matt, I mean, if you just looked back at the diet you were eating when it was 3,000 calories, I bet if you added up the fiber, you wouldn't even, you would probably not make 20 grams of fiber in a day. It was weak, but yeah. But when you flipped it, when you started changing what you did and you started losing the weight, I bet the fiber really went up to about 30 to 35 grams a day. And it's that simple. Once you start getting that in your system and you start to feel that bulk, you're going to eat a lot less and still be very satisfied. Mm -hmm. Still feel like you're, you've been full for the whole day. That was the big thing. Is like I, never, I was never satisfied. Yeah. And then when I changed it, it was, it was remarkable how many, how many things you walked by at the grocery store, though. The I stuff know. that you used to like. I like, oh, I'll have that. You, know? yeah. you walked by a whole bunch of stuff. You start reading a lot more. You start doing a little bit. And it's not a lot. It's just a little bit. A little bit. And then as time, you know, that being extraordinary is extraordinary a little bit. And doing that over time, it really did change. And then you, your mind changed. My mind changed. And when you lose the weight, your confidence changes and your, your, your outlook changes. Your relationships change. You know, your, the way you communicate with people changes. The way they accept you when you walk in the room changes. All eyes on Matt yeah. now that he looks like this. Where before marginalized, just another person, yeah. just ordinary, yeah. not extraordinary. Yeah. So it does yeah. change everything. You're absolutely right. Now, aside from being a doctor, a nutritionist, family man, um, you uh, also, I see, you know, I follow you on Facebook. Uh -huh. um, I see that you do a lot of personal growth too. Yes. You know, I think that's one thing in life a lot of people overlook is personal growth. Because if you're not growing, you're probably regressing. You're not even staying the same. You're probably regressing, unfortunately. Um, you do a lot of personal growth. You do a lot of stuff. You know, it, tell me, like, where do you find the time and, and why? Well, I think it's one of our priorities. I think I learned it from my kids, too. My kids kind of push us, push Pamela and I, with the new, whether it's technology or even new thoughts, new ways that people are doing things. Um, so I think personal growth just was one of our priorities. Okay. I've always thought, and I, I really believe this is true, that our brain runs the whole system. A lot of dogs will laugh at me saying, duh, you know, but we don't think of it that way. Some of us protect our cell phones with these really great cell phone covers. We, we, um, we protect our computers at home or laptops in special bags just to make sure we don't damage them because we know how important that computer is to us with our lives. Well, the same thing about your brain. And if you don't continue to feed your brain with new thoughts and growth and continue exercising your brain, then it's never going to be able to run the whole system below it. 
in your body properly. You know, that whole biochemical cascade that gets triggered. As you even said, you were gaining weight because you thought maybe it was a lot of stress that was happening in your life. Well, that's true because your brain was then controlling where you were storing food, how you were getting your pleasure. And if you have a lot of outside pressures, a lot of stress, your brain's going to look for other ways to keep itself healthy. And a lot of times people revert to eating foods that trigger those neurotransmitters in your brain to give you that sense of pleasure or relaxation because they're the same neurotransmitters that work with drugs and certain even addictions that people have. Mm -hmm. But people get that addiction to sugar or fats because they think that's, that's really what's giving them, that's what their brain is giving them to enable their body to continue getting through those stressful times. So I just really try to do personal development. I really try to grow with my family because I understand how important that is for my brain to stay healthy because it has to run everything else, mm -hmm. just like our computers at home. Yeah. Well, your subconscious is what runs, uh, what, what, what causes you to function on a daily basis. Right. And the only way to change your subconscious mind is to put new and better thoughts in continuously, not just one time, because your conscious mind isn't very strong at all. No. Um, Easily but your, influenced. Yeah. Yes. Your subconscious mind is determined and it will follow whatever programming you've just kept laying in there. And the programming from generations yeah. before us because it's all kind of in the genetics there to push us in certain ways. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say was that, right. you know, we were all programmed at an early age by our families. We didn't even that's know right. it, you know? That's right. And uh, you go by, sometimes you realize, I did a course one time and uh, they, they suggested in the course that you're running, your program is running and you're making decisions right now based on what a five-year-old is thinking. Yeah. <laughs> and when you break it down and think about it, you'd be like, well, yeah, that's true. I was. I didn't even realize I was doing that. So I want to ask you another question. Sure. So what, uh, how about sharing with us right now what uh, is uh, maybe a goal your, your, uh, you and Pamela, your family, are uh, in the midst of or about to start or even accomplishing? Maybe, maybe one of each if you could. So, uh, you know, Pamela and I are really trying to get this lifestyle medicine out. So we made a, a, a business, a, we, we put a message out. We're trying to get this message out to the world. So we created really a virtual community, a virtual medical practice where it's run through social media, it's run through events that we hold so that people can see us and learn from us and, and try to capture the message or capture the, the knowledge that we have. So we're trying to create a virtual practice of medicine okay. that's going to not only keep people well, but then enable people to stay well the way they were designed to, to live that 100, 120 years that our genetics are design, have designed us to live, but not only to add you know, years to their life, but life to their years. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. So some of our goals is really to just accomplish that through lifestyle medicine. So we created a program together called Lifestyle Design MD. Mm -hmm. lifestyle, I'm the Lifestyle MD, yep. and she's the Lifestyle Design. So together, we can not only help you with your health and your wellness, but we can also help you with your goal setting and, 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 and your relationships and the way that you then interact with people and, have, and you know, conduct your business, conduct your, your family, just because we've had that experience together. Yeah, okay. And how are we going to get in touch? How are we going to be able to uh, get involved in this? Um, you can go to lifestyledesignmd.com yep. and you can learn about some of the um, nutritional principles that I've put together through my travels, through my uh, education with some of the best you know, uh, nutritionists in the country like Dr. Greger or Dr. Katz or Dr. Willett right here at Harvard Medical School, uh, at Harvard uh, School of Public Health. So I'm just... Uh, in, in uh, Lifestyle Design MD, those eight nutritional principles are a great way to start uh, a new way of eating. Um, you can also find me on Facebook. I'm, I'm at Daniel Witkowski MD. Mm -hmm. And on Facebook, I'm trying to get the message out using social media with Facebook Live, trying mm -hmm. to create little wits bits, I call them. Yep. Little bits of information, little health tips on nutrition and wellness and lifestyle that can help people. How about, a, do you got a wits bits for us right now? Could Which you give bits? us one? Sure. Uh, I thought of a few while you were just talking, too. Um, one of the things that um, people don't understand is that we have two types of genes in our body. 
there are dictator genes and there are genes by committee. So many times I hear people tell me in the office, well, my, my father had high blood pressure or everybody's heavy in my family, so I just have those genes for being heavy or for having high cholesterol. There's not a lot I can do about it. Well, that's not true. What we've learned since we've uncovered the human genome is that there are these two types of genes. The dictator genes are the ones that give you your blue eyes or your, or your, or your the skin color. Mm -hmm. And those, you really can't change too much about those. But most genes, and over 95% of your genes, are genes by committee. And everything you do in your life, what you eat, how you think, how you move, how you sleep, influence those genes. They either turn them on or turn them off. And so we're learning that things like high blood pressure, they run in families because they're all doing the same thing. And even if you get that genetic predisposition, as we discover different nucleotide polymorphisms, we call them, different little changes in our genes that we've inherited from our families, you don't have to turn those genes on. If you have a a higher you know, likelihood that you're going to get high blood pressure because you have those changes, you have to then avoid certain things in life, whether it's foods or activities or thoughts, that will then not enable those genes to work. So you won't get those conditions. So lifestyle is so important. Mm -hmm. Yes, you have to know your data. You gotta, like we, talked, we spoke about earlier, you've know, you got to know your data. You might even want to know your genetics and then and, you know, set your life according to those things that you found out, whether it's your genes or it is the things you're eating or doing and, or not doing. So a big Italian family, yeah. they have a lot of big dinners together, yeah. you know, once a week, you know, my, my wife's Italian, uh, there's certain traditions that are passed down. So that kind of gene would be called, uh, we talked about the dictator gene, which is like hair color, right. eyes and everything. And what was the other kind of gene? Genes by committee. Genes by committee. That's right. They yeah. get influenced by the things you're giving them, yeah. know, allowing them to do. Wow. Yeah. It sounds so simple when you say it like that, because I, I mean, it really is simple, but it's like you don't think about it that way. We kind of always think about things as that like, well, that's That you're locked in. Yeah. That once you get your genetic makeup, you're locked in, but that's not true. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Dr. Dan, we've had, uh, we've talked about what you do, talked about your family, talked about personal growth. Now, you know, obviously the objective of uh, the Matt Lagore Show is about you know, inspiring people to reach, you know, their goals. Uh, and if they are at a, a good goal, maybe reach the next level because there's no, there's no finish line. Right. So if you were talking to someone who was struggling or just somebody who wanted to, like, improve themselves, you know, if you had some advice for them, what would it be in a, in a nutshell? As far as their health or every, a, goals? Every, goals, everything. One of the things that I really believe and I've learned is that many of our goals, and no one should have goals that are not high enough, because you know, we're never going to be as great as our goals. Mm -hmm. Keep those goals out on the horizon. Keep them in front of you. Always reach, always push yourself to reach very high goals. But the most important thing when you do that is understand that you might not reach that goal right away. But don't be afraid during that process to measure backwards, to understand, as we talked about earlier, giving yourselves those rewards understand that you know, you've accomplished a lot through the time that you've been going after those goals. So recognize that so that you don't really keep bringing yourself down and not think that you can be as great as anybody else that you're sitting next to or as you walk into the plane when you go on a trip. Why don't I turn to the left? Why do I always turn to the right? You know, what's it going to take to fly first class? Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. You know, why are those people so special? Keep your eye on the target. Keep pushing for those goals. But always remember that you're taking the strides, you're making the steps, measure backwards. Mm -hmm. don't, don't forget about what you've done already. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. that's important. Yeah, write down your accomplishments. Exactly. Yeah, and I celebrate think, them. Yeah, it's easy, it's easy to, to not realize what you've done. And you'll beat yeah. yourself up and you'll never feel good about yourself. And you, it'll show in your expression, the way you carry yourself, the way you communicate with people. Yeah. yeah. Leaders aren't much different than you and I. Leaders, though, understand what they've done and they exude that confidence they exude that that personality type because they look back they've seen what they've done and they feel good about it and it changes everything yeah okay so let's just recap here um when it comes to eating what was the uh saying eat food yes eat food mostly plants mm -hmm. and not much and not much so in other words 
Uh, maybe have, uh, instead of eating three meals a day, uh, you could eat more meals. You could, you could, could you eat as much as you want with that uh, theory there? Like, uh, not as much as you want, right. as often as you'd like. Yes. So when you say not much, it's not much for the total day. Yeah. And when you say mostly plants, the plants are going to give you all that fiber. That fiber is going to bulk you up. You're not going to really look for something and make a bad choice. You know, at, at the times in the day when you're always, you know, that mid-afternoon lull that mm -hmm. people have, that they're looking for that, looking for something. So they grab a cookie or they grab a cracker or they grab a candy bar. Mm -hmm. That's where the people, that's where most people make their mistakes. So just eat mostly plants and that fiber will hold you all day long. All right. And know your numbers, because I think that's one of the things that a lot of people are afraid of. Is the, I know I do it. I don't want to step on the scale today. Mm. I'll step on it tomorrow, because maybe yeah. I'll have lost weight tomorrow. Yeah. So you got to know your numbers. you got to know where you are, because if you don't right. know where you are, you don't know where you're going, right? Right. And then once you decide, after you decide, then you have to really learn what, what the truth is. Understand what you're doing, what it is you're feeding yourself, what it is when you're exercising, how that's helping your body. So understand the truth and then go out and discover what's good for you. What's good for you might not be what's good for me because I might have different tastes than you. Maybe you like things, you know, spicy or you like things, you know, more, um, you know, on, 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 a, um, on a blander side or whatever. You know, don't like it so spicy. So, but I might like things a certain way that that you don't. So as long as we both know, though, because we've discovered the truth behind what we're doing, that what we're doing is good, then we can both sit together, enjoy life together, have, have community, and not have to be so strict about everything being one way. Because one way isn't for everybody. I understand that. But we do know the best way. Right. Okay. So, Dr. Dan Wachowski, uh, lifestyle medicine by design. No, G lifestyle design MD. Lifestyle design MD. We'll make sure it's up on the screen so Thank people you. can check it out on Facebook. Daniel Wachowski, MD. All right. Any last? Uh, any uh, last? Um, anything else you want to say? Uh, last minute uh, suggestions? No. I mean, I think it's important. To just nutrition trumps everything. Yeah. But once you get your nutrition down and you're feeling healthy. Exercise, moving your mass mm -hmm. is what really turns our bodies on and keeps them healthy. Nutrition, move your body, right. know your why, spend time with your family. Get right? your priorities straight. Live through those priorities. Keep your eyes on the horizon. Keep measuring backwards. All right, Dr. Dan, I want to thank you for being on the show today. And we'll have you on Thanks again in the future uh, with a little maybe update uh, with, uh, with uh, the, the progress of your, uh, your new business. Thank you All very right? much. All right, thank you. Thanks for watching The Matt LaGore Show. We'll see you again next time.